This podcast is brought to you by the support of listeners like yourself at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Listeners who become patrons get lots of exclusive content like early access for just $1 a month, a fully referenced patron's guide to each episode for just $3 a month and exclusive patrons podcasts for only $5 a month. This is a new way of making history where you can support the history you enjoy. So if you like what you hear, you can sign up today at Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The Great Famine Part 1, Rebel Isle. The Great Famine is without doubt one of the most important single events in modern Irish history. It impacted almost every aspect of Irish life. Over the coming months, I will be bringing you on a journey to the 1840s. But first, we need to take a look at the background and some of the problems Ireland faced even before the famine began. These were problems that would haunt our ancestors with the onset of famine in 1845. Therefore, this podcast will focus on the life of one remarkable Irish woman, Anne Devlin, an Irish revolutionary with remarkable courage, who was 65 years of age in 1845. Anne will give us a unique insight into Ireland of the 1840s, including Ireland's tumultuous relationship with its nearest neighbour Britain and the toxic religious divide that dominated life at the time. We begin our journey then to the 19th century in a somewhat unusual place as we join a historian looking for a woman in the slums of Dublin in 1842. Three years before the onset of the Great Famine in 1845, the Dublin historian Richard Madden was on the hunt for a woman who could provide him with a unique insight into his latest topic of interest, the United Irishmen, Republican revolutionaries who had staged two rebellions in 1798 and 1803. For Madden, who had only been born in 1798, these were events that had taken place in another era, indeed another Ireland, one that was hard to imagine by the 1840s. He lived in an Ireland crippled by British control of the island, where religion was central to the identity of the people and sectarian tension between Catholics and Protestants dominated life. Fifty years earlier, however, in the 1790s, the United Irishmen had advocated Ireland take a radically different road, one inspired by the French Revolution, which would see Ireland break free from British control and become a non-sectarian, independent republic. It's easy to see then why the United Irishmen intrigued a man like Madden, who lived in such a different Ireland. When he set about writing a history of the United Irishmen, it was far from straightforward. Many of those who had played a central role in their rebellions were dead or long fled. They had risen up against the British authorities in 1798 and again in 1803 and the consequences had been terrible for those involved. Thousands had been killed while many of those who survived were scattered to the four corners of the globe, either through exile or transportation to Australian penal colonies on the far side of the world. However, in Dublin, Richard Madden, knew there was a woman, or at least rumours that she was still alive, called Anne Devlin, who had played a central role in the 1803 rebellion. Finding and talking to her would be crucial for any book on the United Irishman, as Anne Devlin was, in Madden's words, the only person living who could give a correct account of the events. Indeed, Anne Devlin's life was not only a chronicle of rebellion, but her life story also explained why Ireland was a country beset by so many problems in the 1840s and is also crucial for us on our journey which looks at the Great Famine. Now finding Anne Devlin in the 1840s was an odyssey in itself. While Anne had gained fame in the early 19th century, she had subsequently spent years in prison, survived horrendous torture and then, not long after her release, more or less vanished into the growing slums of early 19th century Dublin. Furthermore, even recognising Anne in the 1840s would be difficult. She had been in her mid-twenties when she had been at the centre of Irish revolutionary politics four decades earlier. However, by 1843, she was well in her 60s. Indeed, Madden could not even ask after her by her surname, Devlin, given she would have almost certainly married and changed her name in the intervening 40 years. 
Nevertheless, he did eventually hear tell of a certain Anne Campbell, who prior to her marriage in 1811 was in fact Anne Devlin. While Madden was a man who had travelled the world, his mission to meet Devlin in his native city was an expedition not without risk. When he set out to meet her in her home, he entered the dangerous maze of alleys and streets in the Liberties, an area to the southwest of Dublin city centre. One contemporary recorded it as a crowded and populous part of the town. The fact that one street, Court Purse Lane, was named after local pickpockets spoke volumes to life in the area. In an account worthy of a Charles Dickens novel, another visitor in 1804 had noted, many tons of manure covered the alleys and seemed to threaten a plague. It was in this teeming mass of poverty and dirt that Madden eventually found Anne Devlin in a house on John's Lane off Thomas Street. In 1842, aged 62, she certainly did not look like a figure of great importance. Richard Madden described Anne Devlin as a common washerwoman living in a miserable hovel, utterly unnoticed by and unknown, except among the poor of her own class. However, this wizened woman, carrying the scars of a hard but remarkable life, could offer insights into how Ireland found itself one of the most impoverished and religiously divided corners of Europe in the 1840s. By the 1840s, the Ireland of Anne Devlin's youth and the different visions of Ireland that it seemed possible when she was a teenager were a relic of a bygone age. She had been born in what was known as the Kingdom of Ireland, but on January the 1st, 1801, that kingdom had ceased to be when Ireland was incorporated into the United Kingdom, after which it was ruled directly from London. The Kingdom of Ireland had been one built on sectarian discrimination, hatred and inequality. Its origins stretched all the way back to 1169, when Norman mercenaries invaded Ireland. However, it was only around the year 1700 that the kingdom began to take the shape Anne Devlin recognised. The Battle of the Boyne in 1690 had seen a Protestant king, William of Orange, defeat his Catholic rival, James II, and this had proved a decisive moment for the kingdom. It brought to an end 150 years of conflict. However, while the following century was a time of comparative peace for Ireland, one could not say Anne Devlin was born into a harmonious kingdom. After William of Orange's victory at the Battle of the Boyne, something along the lines of an apartheid society took hold in Ireland. Protestants, who comprised less than 20% of the population, took control of political life and to a lesser extent economic life, pushing all others to the margins. Around the year 1700, what were known as the Penal Laws formalised this discrimination. Catholics, like Anne Devlin's family, who constituted about 75% of the population, were banned from political life. They could not stand in elections and after 1728 they lost the right to vote. While no women and most men could not vote at this time, this nevertheless symbolised the complete and total disenfranchisement of Catholics. Perhaps more importantly for poorer Catholics, they were also banned from owning land, bearing arms or involvement in the legal profession. While historians debate how effective these laws actually were, there is little doubt they did serve to impoverish many Catholics and certainly bred deep resentments. While the primary target of the penal laws had been Catholics, Presbyterians, known as dissenters, the smallest religious group on the island, were also affected. They were effectively banned from public life as well. While the ultimate aim of the laws was to copper fasten British domination over Ireland, and what was considered its rebellious Catholic population. By the time Anne Devlin's mother, Winifred, was born in 1753, the penal laws were increasingly outdated. Irish Catholics clearly posed no threat. There had been two attempts to install a Catholic king in England in 1715 and 1745, and on both occasions Irish Catholics had not supported these rebellions. Therefore, the continued discrimination only served to breed resentments and increasingly a growing number of Irish Protestants believed the penal laws should be lifted. Indeed, by the time of Anne Devlin's birth in 1780, many of the penal laws were no longer being implemented. Indeed, it appeared Anne was going to grow up in an Ireland where the future for the first time in well over a century seemed to be changing and changing in a positive direction. By the 1780s there were clear reasons to be hopeful as even the Protestant elite who dominated society were increasingly disgruntled. Music 
Although their dominance of political life was uncontested, the Protestant elite in Ireland were increasingly frustrated by the time Anne Devlin was born in 1780. While the monarch of the Kingdom of Ireland was the King of England, it was theoretically ruled by an exclusively Protestant Parliament which met in a beautiful complex on College Green opposite Trinity College in Dublin. However, through the 18th century, increasing interference from England created tensions. While since the 1490s all acts of the Irish Parliament had to be ratified in England, in 1720 the British Parliament claimed its right to overrule its Irish counterpart if it so wished. Further to this, trade was another bone of contention. Britain demanded exclusive rights to Irish markets, something that clearly benefited Britain. Irish merchants naturally wanted free trade, or the right to sell to whomever they pleased. Anger around these issues built up through the course of the 18th century, creating an increasingly volatile situation among many Irish Protestants. When rumours circulated through Dublin in 1759 that the Irish Parliament was going to be abolished and Ireland ruled directly from Britain, Protestants in the city rioted. Therefore, by 1780, when Anne Devlin was born, almost all sections of the Irish population now had their grievances. Protestants wanted parliamentary and trade reform, while disenfranchised Presbyterians and Catholics like the Devlins wanted equality under the law. While long-running sectarian tension had ensured that ultimately the British government could play Catholics off against Protestants, the outbreak of war in the late 18th century rapidly changed this situation. In 1757, the first truly global conflict in world history, the Seven Years' War, began as Britain fought its enemies across the three continents. While this drew to a close in 1763, this was followed by the American War of Independence and then War with France. These continued conflicts transformed Ireland and the fortunes of Protestants, Catholics and Presbyterians. Firstly, for some Catholics at least, increased warfare brought with it increased opportunities. These wars saw the British army develop an insatiable appetite for manpower and in the 1770s and 1780s wealthy Irish Catholics offered to support the efforts of British army recruiters in Ireland in return for a relaxing of the penal laws. While Catholics gained a bargaining chip which they could use as leverage for better rights, Protestant demands for political reform also gained momentum. The fear of a French invasion in the late 1770s had seen the formation of what were called the Protestant Volunteer Corps, ostensibly militias to defend Ireland in the event of an invasion. However, these very quickly turned into political organisations which began to focus on parliamentary reform and the issue of trade rights. The Volunteer Corps also added an edge to Irish politics unseen before. In December 1779, they paraded through Dublin with a cannon draped with the slogan free trade or else. It was clear the central figure in our story today, Anne Devlin, was going to grow up in a world where change appeared to be coming one way or another and in her early childhood the situation began to develop rapidly. Fearful of unrest, the British government tried to split the Protestant volunteers and shatter any potential unity with Catholics by announcing they were going to introduce further Catholic reforms in 1781. This, they assumed, would serve to divide Protestants between those in favour of Catholic emancipation and those fearful about where it would lead. This completely backfired. When the Protestant Volunteer Corps met in Dungannon, County Tyrone in February 1782, they cut what seemed to be the Gordian knot holding back Irish demands when they actually welcomed the proposed relaxation of the penal laws which discriminated against Catholics. This stunned many. Most had expected the Volunteer Corps to adopt a more sectarian position in opposition to Catholic reform. For the young Anne Devlin, the possibility that she would live in Ireland, remarkably different to that of her grandparents, now seemed possible, more than it ever had. Religious divides and sectarianism seemed to be giving way to a new political movement. For the British government, however, this could not have happened at a worse time. Just as Ireland was moving tentatively towards a more united opposition which could possibly straddle the religious divide, the British army was staring down the barrel of a catastrophic defeat in the American War of Independence. Desperate to avoid upheaval in Ireland, they had no choice but to cede to at least some of the demands of both Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants. Therefore, in 1782, Catholics were legally granted freedom to worship their religion. While it had been a fact of life for decades, it was a milestone nonetheless. 
In return, Catholic leaders continued to encourage young men to join the army to great effect. Between 1793 and 1815, around 16% of all Irish men would serve the crown. Protestant leaders also secured concessions on their key demand of increased autonomy for the Irish Parliament. This new Parliament, with its extra powers, which could no longer be ruled over by its British counterpart, was called Grattan's Parliament, named after Henry Grattan, a leading Protestant politician. While some at the time, and since then, have heralded this as the dawn of a new era, it proved to be something of a fallstone. You see, even after the 1782 reforms, the British government still chose the King's representative in Ireland, that's the Lord Lieutenant, and he in turn chose the Irish executive, essentially the government of Ireland. They then in turn were able to bribe Irish parliamentarians as they controlled lucrative appointments and positions. Therefore, these reforms really only served to encourage further demands. Catholics continued to demand full rights in all respects, or emancipation as it was called, while Protestants wanted more comprehensive parliamentary reform. However, the key to the successes of 1782, which had been a non-sectarian, increasingly united opposition, soon floundered. In 1783, the Protestant reform movement fell under the leadership of sectarians intent on denying Catholic emancipation. This not only divided Catholics and Protestants, but also Protestants amongst themselves, many of whom believed the time had come to repeal the penal laws which discriminated against Catholics. In the coming years, this reform movement, which had promised so much, went into decline, not least because of the re-emergence of sectarianism. As if it was needed, this served to remind everyone that even if major strides in relation to moving beyond sectarian divisions had been made, it was still a feature of life in Ireland in the late 18th century. Indeed, it is important not to overestimate the change taking place in the country. Sectarian tension between Catholics and Protestants may have been in retreat, but it was by no means dead. Indeed, the early years of Anne Devlin's life were a testament to this. Through the first few years of Anne Devlin's life, her family lived on a 21-acre farm at Cronbeg near Ockram in County Wicklow. While there had been tentative moves for unity between Catholics and Protestants on a political level and the penal laws were being slowly relaxed, it would be a mistake to see Ireland as a harmonious society at the time. Many on both sides of the religious divide were rapidly sectarian. While Anne was still a child, her family did prosper and eventually rented a large farm of 31 acres a few miles from Cronbeg. To secure this, they were remarkably lucky. The policy of their new landlord, Lord Strafford, was, and I quote, to set his estate to a Protestant colony and not to suffer any Roman Catholics to live on his land. This form of discrimination would continue to be a feature of life for centuries and in the 1780s it illustrated that Ireland had a long, long way to go. In their case, the Devlins were probably able to rent this land because it had been already sublet and Lord Strafford was probably unaware of his tenants' religious background. Nevertheless, while the Devlins lived in a world where they were constantly reminded of their second-class status as Catholics, international events in the late 1780s offered the possibility of change for the second time in Anne Devlin's childhood. This was the French Revolution of 1789. Now, to summarise a remarkably complex revolution in one line, basically, the people of France rose up, in theory at least, under the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. In Ireland, though, this slogan and the revolution itself offered inspiration and the possibility of a new political framework where politics could move beyond sectarianism. Unsurprisingly, these ideas of the French Revolution proved contagious and spread to Ireland, finding root in particular amongst Presbyterian communities in Ulster. While France was the key inspiration, undoubtedly the tens of thousands of Irish Presbyterians who had already emigrated to the USA, another country that had recently embraced republicanism, undoubtedly influenced their relatives back home too. One way or another, in the stifling sectarian climate of Ireland in the late 18th century, these ideas must have been a breath of fresh air for those seeking change, and soon Ireland was chasing America and France down the republican road. By late 1791, a new republican organisation, one that would profoundly shape Anne Devlin's life, the Society of United Irishmen, was formed with a radical vision for Ireland. One of the leading members of the society, the Unitarian Protestant Archibald Hamilton Rowan, later articulated the United Irishmen's ideas when he said, 
one law ought to bind Catholic and Protestant, Jew and Mohammedan, if Irishmen. It was the barrister Theobald Wolfe Tone who summed up the United Irishmen best when he said their goals were to unite Protestant, Catholic and dissenter under the common name of Irishmen in order to break the connection with England, the never-fading source of all our political evils. This had widespread appeal in a country where all sections of society had their grievances. The British government was naturally fearful of any such movement and tried to stop Catholics gravitating towards the United Irishmen by repealing most of the discriminatory penal laws in 1793. However, like the reforms of the 1780s, this only created an appetite for further reform when Catholics were refused full emancipation. In time, Catholics increasingly gravitated towards the United Irishmen, and within seven years from its foundation, the new organisation had tens of thousands of members from all religious backgrounds. Leading figures included Presbyterians like Oliver Bond, Protestants such as Lord Edward Fitzgerald, Napper Tandy, Thomas Addis Emmet, and Catholics, one of the most famous being Anne Devlin's cousin, Michael Dwyer, who joined in 1797. In time, Anne herself would become the most famous woman associated with this movement. While the Society of United Irishmen had initially focused their demands on parliamentary reform, this changed through the course of the 1790s. When war broke out between Britain and revolutionary France, the country that inspired the United Irishmen, the British authorities in Ireland increasingly viewed the United Irishmen as an enemy within and banned the organisation. This only served to radicalise its membership. As is so often the case, when the hope of political reform faded, the only path that lay open was one of revolution, armed rebellion and independence. Having chosen this course of action, the Society of United Irishmen began to seek military aid from revolutionary France to establish an Irish Republic. It was at this point that these events began to influence Anne Devlin's life directly. Ireland was inexorably moving towards a crossroads where very different futures lay ahead. One was a future with Britain, the other was one of revolution. By 1797, tensions in Ireland were building as the United Irishmen had recruited tens of thousands. Its tentacles spread throughout the island and in Wicklow several more of Anne Devlin's relations, including her cousins Arthur Devlin and Hugh Byrne, joined up. The rebels were ready to rise once they received a guarantee of military support from revolutionary France. They had not long to wait because in 1798 word arrived, support was on its way and Ireland was about to rise up in rebellion. But before we look at this, I want to take a quick break. The 1798 rebellion, the first and largest republican uprising in Irish history, was hampered from the outset by infiltrators and spies who kept the British authorities based in Dublin Castle abreast of all developments. Aware that a rising was in the offing, they arrested the leading United Irishmen around Dublin on March 12th, 1798, and this threw the plans into upheaval. However, Lord Edward Fitzgerald was one of the most prominent figures to evade capture, and the plans continued, albeit now fractured. The signal for the rising was the seizure of mail coaches leaving Dublin on May the 23rd. When the counties surrounding Dublin rose in rebellion after this signal, it was ferociously put down by a campaign of counter-revolutionary terror. Suspected rebels and sympathisers were subjected to half-hangings, where the victim is cut down before they expire, pitch-cappings, a horrendous practice where victims were scalped using hot tar, and also summary executions. In late May, the countryside around Anne Devlin's home in County Wicklow witnessed some of the worst atrocities. The summary execution of 34 suspected United Irishmen in Dunlavin, only 30 miles away, and then another mass execution in Carnew, only 20 miles away, shocked the population. However, this terror also served to push many over the edge, and in nearby North Wexford, large numbers, fearing government reprisals, began to join the rebels. This surge in support was buoyed on by the first major rebel victory at Ullart in Wexford around the same time. In the coming weeks, the rebels in Wexford enjoyed successes, first taking the town of Enniscorthy and then Wexford itself. The principles of the United Irishmen of building a movement that was explicitly non-sectarian were severely tested in the brutality of that summer in Wexford in 1798. The savage terror that had been launched by British troops and militias was largely directed at Catholics 
and this added a sectarian dimension to the rising in Wexford. Indeed, there were massacres of innocent Protestants by some rebels and attempts to forcibly convert other Protestants in Wexford town. While these events were limited, this would form the basis of enduring propaganda and their interpretations of the rising in decades afterwards. Ultimately, the fortunes of the Wexford rebels reached a turning point when they were defeated at the Battle of Vinegar Hill by a veteran of the American Revolutionary War, General Lake. While the rebellion petered out in Wexford, through the course of that summer, other parts of the country rose up in revolt. The birthplace of Irish republicanism, the Presbyterian communities of eastern Ulster, rose in early June and, although it attracted large numbers, it too was savagely suppressed. French reinforcements did eventually land in Mayo, but not until August when the major uprisings had been quashed and they too were defeated after initial successes. Despite its early promise, the rebellion lacked coordination and was eventually completely put down and was followed by ferocious repression. By the end of the summer of 1798, it was only in Wicklow that Anne Devlin's cousin, Michael Dwyer, held out, proving himself an able commander who could use the mountainous terrain of Wicklow to great effect. While it must have seemed all hell was breaking loose around the family, Anne's father had remained completely neutral, but when wounded rebels turned up at their door, they did offer help. In time, it proved almost impossible for the Devlins not to get involved. While her father remained aloof, Anne herself, however, did relay messages to her cousin, the rebel leader Michael Dwyer in the Wicklow Mountains. The dangers posed by this were extreme. If she was captured, she could expect no mercy as her later life so clearly and brutally illustrated. Ultimately, thousands were tortured or killed, and according to some accounts, the Devlin family home was just one of thousands destroyed in the bitter wave of violent recriminations that followed the rising. While militias and the British army doled out terrible retribution across the island to any they suspected of being involved or supportive of the rebellion, in Britain, the Prime Minister, William Pitt, was planning a political response, one that would transform Ireland in the coming decades. This was the Act of Union. While this happened far from the battlefields of the Rising, it would have far more reaching consequences than any of the violence in that summer of 1798. And it is something we will constantly refer back to when discussing the Great Famine. So next we need to look at what exactly the Act of Union was. The British Prime Minister, William Pitt, had long believed that the 1782 reforms were problematic and the ultimate solution for Ireland was to dissolve the Kingdom of Ireland, abolish the Irish Parliament and amalgamate Ireland into the United Kingdom. Under this Act of Union, Ireland would cease to be a separate entity from Britain in any way, shape or form. Ireland would no longer have a Parliament, instead its MPs would travel to Westminster in London, just like MPs from Cornwall or Yorkshire did. In Pitt's mind, this would end the question of Ireland's future once and for all. However, there was one stumbling block. While the savage repression that followed the 1798 rebellion more or less ensured there would be no major popular opposition, the Parliament of the Kingdom of Ireland, which met in Dublin, would first have to vote for the Act of Union and essentially vote itself out of existence. While there were some in the Parliament ideologically opposed to Union, Many members were notoriously corrupt and would be slow to vote for the Act of Union which would put an end to the system of bribery which operated in the Irish Parliament. So unsurprisingly, on the first occasion the Act of Union was put to a vote in 1799, it was rejected by five votes. Modifications to the terms and a more rigorous campaign, and not a little bribery, saw the Act carried by a clear majority in the summer of 1800. It must be said, though, at the time, many were not dissatisfied with the prospect of union with Great Britain. Given the prospect of independence had been totally dashed in 1798, many held out hope for what lay ahead. Catholics had been promised emancipation if union was passed, while Protestants supported union, securing the knowledge that while they were a minority in Ireland, it would be Catholics who were a minority in the enlarged United Kingdom that incorporated Ireland. So, having passed the Act of Union on January 1st, 1801, the Kingdom of Ireland, where Anne Devlin was born, ceased to be. This decision and the fallout have haunted Ireland ever since, but it was particularly harshly felt during the generation that lived during the Great Famine, in ways that were unimaginable in 1801. 
while we will revisit the Act of Union throughout the series, for now it's important to note one of the most important changes that took place. From 1801 onwards, decisions regarding Ireland, its governance and importantly its economy were now taken in a British Parliament where the 100 Irish MPs were outnumbered by 558 from the rest of Britain. Ireland was reduced to little more now than the poorest province of Britain and it would be administered in accordance to what was in Britain's best interests, regardless of whether it benefited Ireland. While the old Parliament in Dublin had been far from ideal, it had provided some form of voice for Ireland, albeit a corrupt and all too often sectarian one. While the Act of Union would go on to transform Ireland, few at the time could have really grasped how much. For the likes of Anne Devlin and her family, during the period when the Act of Union was being voted on, they, like so many others, had far more pressing concerns. The years between 1798 and the time the Act of Union was voted on were very difficult in many respects. The 1798 rebellion and the repression that followed had seen wholesale destruction of farms across the island and this led to barred harvests. Indeed, some several years later, a visitor to Ireland, Mary Ann Grant, noted that fields that might be made to teem with luxuriant crops were totally neglected and covered with loose stones. Many vestiges of the rebellion were to be seen. In the immediate aftermath, poor weather didn't help. 1799 was described as one of general deficiency in the crops and a consequent failure of the usual nourishment of the poor. 1800 was no better and indeed Anne's home county of Wicklow was particularly badly hit. One account from the region in the year 1800 reported this year the price of food was enormous. To add to this, Anne's father, although innocent of involvement in the rising, had been arrested and imprisoned in Wicklow jail for 30 months while he awaited trial and indeed he was only released as the Act of Union came into force. When he was released, the family decided to leave Wicklow and move to Rathfarnham, which was then a few miles outside the limits of Dublin city. Here, Anne's life was transformed as plans for another rebellion were drawn up. While the 1798 rebellion had been brutally stamped out, Anne Devlin's cousin, Michael Dwyer, had led a force of rebels who held out in the natural fortress that was the Wicklow Mountains. They suffered a major setback in 1799 when several of these rebels were captured and executed. Indeed, Anne herself had to help other women in Wicklow to exhume these bodies from a mass grave and give them proper burials. While this left Michael Dwyer isolated, by 1802, even though the Act of Union was coming into effect, the United Irishmen were beginning to regroup in Dublin. That year, the 24-year-old Robert Emmett, who had spent some time in France, returned to Ireland with great energy and enthusiasm for a new rebellion, but he had also learned from the mistakes made in 1798. Anne Devlin's cousin, Arthur Devlin, another United Irishman, approached her father to help Robert Emmett find a house in Dublin to function as his headquarters. Initially, the Devlin's own house was offered, but Emmett felt this unsatisfactory, and a nearby residence in Rathfarnham was rented for the purpose. Emmett needed what was initially supposed to be a housekeeper and Anne Devlin's sister Julie was chosen. However, she was unable for what was inevitably going to be a dangerous position and it fell to Anne herself to work for free for Robert Emmett. However, Anne became far more than a housekeeper as Emmett planned what he hoped would be a streamlined version of 1798, which would render the Act of Union irrelevant as Ireland rose up and broke free and established itself as an independent republic. He correctly assessed that a major problem in 1798 had been the level of infiltration, so he decided no more than a handful of people should be aware of the plans. They would serve as officers and, he somewhat ambitiously and vaguely assumed, the people would rise up when called upon. While later generations would demote Anne's role in the planning to that of Emmett's loyal servant, she played a vital role and indeed Robert Emmett himself referred to her as one of our own. Her commitment in this regard would be tested to the utmost. Ultimately, the rebellion in 1803 proved to be a pale imitation of the events of 1798. Emmett's more clandestine approach was successful in keeping the revolt secret from the prying eyes of British spies. However, an accidental explosion of a cache of gunpowder he had stored away in Dublin led him to believe that the authorities were on to him. Although this was not the case, he rushed his final preparations to act before he assumed what would be an inevitable wave of repression. 
The rising that went ahead lasted little more than a few hours on July the 23rd, 1803. Robert Emmett himself fled back to the house in Rathfarnham after it failed, where the steely Anne Devlin was nonplussed by his arrival. When interviewed by the historian Richard Madden in 1843, she recalled how she greeted Emmett and a group of followers who arrived back in Rathfarnham with these words. Bad welcome to you. Is the world lost by you, you cowards, that you are to lead the people to destruction and then to leave them? Regardless, Emmett stayed in Rathfarnham that night before fleeing south to the Wicklow Mountains. Anne Devlin remained in his house in Rathfarnham in what was an extremely dangerous position and had she known how dangerous it was she may well have taken flight with Emmett. The ferocity of the repression that followed the 1798 rebellion was unleashed again but on an even more extreme scale in 1803 and when soldiers arrived at the house where Emmett had been based Anne Devlin was subjected to a horrific ordeal. Soldiers surrounded her with bayonets drawn and pressed up against her until she was lacerated all over her body. She was interrogated but she pretended she knew nothing about who Emmett was or where he had gone. Not believing what she said, the soldiers hauled her into the yard of the house where a makeshift gallows was erected. Nevertheless, she would still not relent and tell them what she knew. A noose was looped around her neck and, according to her own account, she was barely able to utter the words, The Lord Jesus have mercy on my soul, before the rope was pulled and Anne dangled at the end of a noose. After a few minutes, the soldiers relaxed the rope and Anne, still alive, collapsed on the ground gasping for air before she was brought to Dublin Castle. Her ordeal, however, was only beginning. In the following weeks, Anne was constantly questioned in Kilmainham Jail. She was even offered £500, around 40 years' wages, but she still refused to reveal where Robert Emmett had gone. Eventually, Robert Emmett was captured, but Anne still refused to cooperate, and for this she paid dearly. When Emmett was sentenced to death, hanged and then posthumously beheaded, Anne was brought to the gallows in the aftermath and forced to look at his blood on the scaffold. If ever there was a symbol that revolution and republicanism had been defeated and union with Britain was here to say, this was it. Indeed, across Dublin, other symbols of Irish political identity were destroyed. The Irish Parliament, a beautiful structure dominating the city centre, was sold to the Bank of Ireland in 1803 on the condition it be restructured so it could never again serve as a public debating chamber. Anne Devlin would spend several years in shocking prison conditions for her role in the rebellion. An open sewer with four inches of raw sewage flowed past her cell and unsurprisingly she contracted a severe form of erysipelas, a skin disease. Released in 1806, she recovered and would eventually marry her husband, Thomas Campbell, but she emerged into an Ireland that was sinking back into one where sectarian divisions dominated life. The aspirations and dreams of the United Irishmen people like Wolf Tone, Robert Emmett and Anne herself, were obliterated as sectarianism re-emerged to dominate Irish society. While it had seemed to be in retreat in the 1780s and 1790s, it was resurgent after the Act of Union. Indeed, it was already becoming apparent while Anne Devlin was languishing in her prison cell. After the Act of Union was passed, Ireland was not treated or viewed as an equal part of the new enlarged United Kingdom as the proponents of the Act had promised. Instead, Ireland was more or less an internal colony. In the words of one Lord Lieutenant, that's the King's representative in Ireland, Lord Whitworth, Ireland was not. To be governed like England is, the character and the spirit of the governed are completely different. To control what was an internal colony, the British government fell back on sectarianism. While the British Prime Minister William Pitt genuinely intended to live up to his promise to introduce Catholic emancipation, King George III flatly rejected the proposition. This left Catholics, the vast majority of the Irish population, barred from taking a seat in Parliament, senior positions in the army or navy, becoming judges or rising through the ranks of the civil service. Therefore, a sectarian foundation was laid to what was supposed to be a new departure for Ireland as wealthy Protestants continued to be the dominant elite. In the decades that followed, a catch-22 emerged in Ireland where any gain for one religious group was seen as a defeat for the other so the island was continuously, internally divided. As Catholics continued to campaign for full emancipation through the 1810s and especially the 1820s, this was viewed as a threat by Protestants. While emancipation was by no means a sectarian demand, nor intended to be one, given the nature of life under the Union, Protestants naturally considered it a threat as they feared increased Catholic power. 
if you are interested in this topic, the next patron's podcast will be on Catholic emancipation. Anne Devlin herself faced continual harassment from the authorities, even though she had been released from prison in 1806. Perhaps because of this and the fact that she had three young children meant she shied away from any political involvement. That said, the political environment she had once known scarcely existed. While sectarianism had never gone away, the republican non-sectarian values that had gained traction in her youth did offer a very different future. All that must have seemed like a dream in 19th century Ireland. Indeed, when Anne met the historian Richard Madden in the 1840s, she was almost like a relic of another era. She was, in many respects, the last of her generation. Her cousin, Michael Dwyer, who had continued to fight the British, had handed himself in late in 1803 and was transported to Australia, where he would somewhat ironically eventually become a policeman. The hopes and potential offered by the political movements of the reformers and, most importantly, the Society of United Irishmen of Anne Devlin's youth had long passed. Ireland had firmly turned at that crossroads at 1800 and headed down a path which deepened inequality, heightened sectarianism and, as we shall see in the next episode, damaged the economy. This story of the Act of Union and sectarianism are crucial as we move forward towards the Great Famine. Being on one side or the other of the sectarian divide, be a Catholic, Protestant or dissenter, did not provide immunity from the effects of famine but it was one of the most important divides in 19th century Ireland from the perspective of those who lived at the time and shaped how people acted, reacted and viewed Ireland. In the next episode, we will look at daily life after the Act of Union, where the need for economic reform was neglected, the poor were getting poorer, the population was growing and society was becoming increasingly unsettled as economic struggles became increasingly violent. Before I finish, I should say, Anne Devlin did live through the Great Famine and she does not completely fade from our story just yet. I will return to Anne at some point later in the series to check in on her life because as the Great Famine approaches she was living in a Dublin slum, not a safe place to be when the Irish economy and society were about to implode. If you want to find out more about this topic become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and check out the patron's guide. If you want to get in touch, you can contact me there as well. Until next time, Sloan.